<laughs> okay. Last year, Tears of the Kingdom came out and it is, I would say, one of the greatest video games ever made. And I believe I'm standing alongside a lot of other people who have made that claim as well. This was very interesting though, because alongside playing that game, you know, I'm always researching, I'm always learning, and I've been going through a lot of material by a certain Eastern mystic guru yogi master named Paramahansa Yogananda. And his material is just outstanding. If you have never read Autobiography of a Yogi or some of his other works like Man's Eternal Quest, I just so highly recommend it because he just frames everything in existence in such a beautiful, concise, and clear way. And he also draws a lot of parallels between the different esoteric and religious and spiritual systems that exist. And that has provided a lot of fuel for my own growth in this last year. Yogananda describes something very interesting that correlates with The Legend of Zelda. And I started to realize this series is actually a perfect metaphor or archetype or, or expression of our reality at the most fundamental of levels. And here's what I mean. In Zelda, you have this concept of the Triforce. From the very beginning, there's always this three triangles. Of course, it's like sacred geometry rooted in a video game spanning back from the 70s and 80s or whenever the first game was made. The Triforce is always reflected by these three ideas. Just as we have, as we've explored here on this channel before, like the, the pillars of creation, truth, love, and authenticity sort of thing, Within Zelda, there is the Triforce of power, wisdom, and courage. Wisdom is being held in Zelda by Princess Zelda. And then the Triforce of courage is being held by Link. And then the Triforce of power is always held by Ganondorf or the villain, you know, in some way. Start to look then at the esoteric systems. In fact, we explored this briefly in the episode three of our Everything Explained series where the atomic structure, the basic atomic structure, of course, because there's so many subatomic particles, but the basic thing is you've got the electron, the proton, and the neutron. One is positive, one is neutral, and one is negative. The positive and the neutral particles are held together in the center of the atom by the strong force, and the electron, the negative force, spins around it. Now, in Yogananda's book, The Second Coming of Christ, he actually explains very clearly this this descent of creation from the Supreme Spirit into the manifestation of material reality. And what he says is that there is a vacuum of spirit, there's a non-vibration eternity that is beyond consciousness, but is essentially pure beingness. And from that pure beingness or that place of non-vibration comes the first vibration. And that first vibration is consciousness. This is the word of God. This is the vibration of creation, which is also associated with the divine feminine, with essentially the first foundation upon which the reality comes into being. And then spirit shines its light, its pure beingness, which is the Christ consciousness, into that field, giving you a reality of light and sound, which is where we get the wave particle duality from. Now, as that vibration is descending into density, basically, right? Because you have, if consciousness is the first vibration of spirit, then you have, as we've seen on the tree of life, this continual emanation or reflection of those vibrations and the light becoming denser and denser and denser until you have a solid tangible material reality forming at the bottom of the tree. But along that journey, there is a division that takes place within the vibration where there is a split of a positive and negative force. There is a necessity of a negative force that comes into being which helps hold the physical structures in place so that they don't dissolve. Because if everything is just pure energy and pure light and just consciousness, then what's to stop the whole of material reality from dissolving back into, back into light? And it's essentially the ignorance, the veils that are put over these emanations or put over the spheres of creation that keep everything held in place. And there is a, by necessity, a negative force that is required to hold that thing in place. The way that that shows up on an atomic level, at least according to Yogananda, is that you have the positive and the neutral force held together, the divine masculine and the divine feminine held together with the negative force. 
It spins so fast, they're all spinning so fast that it creates the illusion of solidness, even though it's just pure potential energy. So then here we are existing in the world, making sense of life. And now we're developing to this, into this very technologically driven era of society. We have so many different ways of expressing ourselves. And in fact, I think there are so many different stories that compel or portray this idea really, really well. But Zelda is one of the best video games that does it because it literally then is about the positive and the neutral force, the center point, the divine feminine, and Link, her protector, holding the space or holding the field of goodness while the evil force reigns supreme. And you have to go off in order to destroy the evil and restore balance and harmony and creating a world of light. And then the game also portrays these long cycles of time because Humanity has been through so many massive cycles, right? Looking at history alone, whether it's the ancient Egyptians, rise and fall, Greeks, rise and fall, Rome, rise and fall. The cycles that we go through and the rise of technology and everything like that really is also depicted so well through The Legend of Zelda because every game takes place thousands of years well, for the most part, not all of them, but thousands of years apart from each other in this massive timeline, showing that there are these like rising and falling of cycles where evil emerges and then it's quelled and then it's, it emerges and it's quelled. And humanity has just gone through this a lot. And it's really interesting too, because if you look at the Bhagavad Gita and you listen to what Krishna says, I mean, he's talking about humanity being steeped in ignorance and suffering literally 4,000 years ago. In fact, that number might not even be right. It is crazy to see that some of the same problems that we're dealing with today are the same problems that were written about 2,000 years BCE. So what does this mean for us today? Is this just everyone should just stop what they're doing and go play Zelda? I mean, on the one hand, if you haven't played it, Tears of the Kingdom is a legendary game. It also has a lot of invitation for creativity so that you can really learn to express yourself and learn more about yourself just by playing it. I think that the big lesson or takeaway for me in this was to recognize how true wisdom, wisdom teachings and reflections of who and what we are in a spiritual sense can be found in places that you might not expect. And I'll probably do another video in the future about Lord of the Rings and Middle Earth because we are basically living in Middle Earth today. And I wanna talk more about what that means because I do mean that more so metaphorically, but it's a really fun conversation to be had. So, you know, what's the, the end goal of this video? I don't know, this was just something that I really wanted to talk about. Thank you very much for watching and I hope this was fun.